dad's hands were king-sized and strong. With his hands, he built our home and fixed all the broken things. Dad's hands gave generously, served humbly, and loved mom tenderly, unselfishly, completely, unendingly. With his hand, dad held me when I was small, steadied me when I stumbled, and guided me in the right direction. When I needed help, I could always count on dad's hands. Sometimes dad's hands corrected me, disciplined me, shielded me, rescued me. Dad's hands protected me. Dad's hands held mine when he walked me down the aisle. His hand gave me to my forever love, who not surprisingly is very much like Dad. Dad's hands were the instruments of his great, big, rugged, tender heart. Dad's hands were strength. Dad's hands were love. With his hands, he praised God, and he prayed to the Father with those big hands. Dad's hands, they were like Jesus' hands to me. God took the strength of a mountain, the majesty of a tree, the warmth of a summer sun, the calm of a quiet sea, the generous soul of nature, the comforting arm of night, the wisdom of ages, the power of the eagle's flight, the joy of a morning in spring, the faith of a mustard seed, the patience of eternity, the depth of a family need. Then God combined all these qualities, and when there was nothing more to add, he knew his masterpiece was complete. And so he called it Dad. Good morning and welcome to Sunday service with the Potomac Valley Church, a community for all people committed to learning what it means to be the church. We're glad you decided to join us for worship. As a church, we're continuing with our series, Constant, Walking with God Through the Messy Middle. Today, we're excited to hear from our guest speaker, Michael Burns from the Two Cities Church in Minneapolis, Minnesota. As always, we pray that this service helps you to draw closer to God and closer to one another. Let's continue with some songs of praise.
in Jesus' name. My hope. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus. Than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust. I dare not trust the sweetest faith.
Summer Key, and I'd like to share with you some information about giving financially at our church. Before we talk about how to give, let's talk about where it goes. Whenever you give to the Potomac Valley Church, you'll have three options to specify where that money goes. General Operations, which supports our church's operating expenses. Benevolence, which we save specifically in order to provide for members in crisis or community members who come to us in need. And lastly, Missions, which is the most wide-reaching category that serves needs locally and abroad with our family of churches and the communities they serve. Now that we know where your financial gift will go, let's talk about how to give. For those of you prepared to give today, you can give online through your own bank using the bill pay function. You can also give through our mobile app using easy and secure payments with PushPay. Finally, you can mail a check or money order to our church office and payments will be processed through our bank weekly. If you missed anything or need additional details and clarification, you can find all of this and more on our website at www.potomacvalleychurch.com slash give. Thank you so much for your participation and heart to serve with a financial gift today. This world does 
Alex Torres, and I'm a Christian in the DC family group, and I'm really excited to be bringing you the community message today. Uh, please excuse my appearance as quarantine hasn't really allowed me to uh, cut my hair or anything, so uh, please bear with me. Um, you know, but I believe that this this year certainly has been like the craziest that I've ever experienced, and um, you know, it's been filled with a lot of pain and a lot of fear and a lot of dread. Um, you know, at this point, I'm just waiting for a full on zombie apocalypse to just totally be the series finale of this year. But until then, you know, here we are. Um, but I'd like to share with you all something that has really helped me in this time um, and ha that has become more relevant in my life. Um, if you could look over in Mark chapter 4, we're going to read from verses 35 through 41. So, Bible says, That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind them, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat, so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Be quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. You know, every time I read this passage in the past, I think I kind of focused in on the wrong thing in this passage, or I think I was kind of missing the main point. And I was always focusing on Jesus' power, and man, the, the winds and the waves, like they obey him, like they shut up because Jesus told them to. But I don't believe that the main passage, the main theme of this passage is to talk about Jesus calming the storm. I think it's it's kind of different. You know, I don't believe Jesus' purpose was to calm the storm. Um, he certainly can if he wants to, but that isn't why he came. You know, that wasn't his purpose. And something that's something I can really struggle with, you know, because I can see all the terrible things that are going on in this world. Um, you know, why are you allowing these devastating wildfires in Australia to plague our world? Why are you allowing thousands of people to lose their jobs, to die in the wake of COVID? Why are you allowing social injustice and racism and bigotry to plague our world and our country? Didn't you see the storm? Like, you're just sleeping. You forgot about us. To me, what this story shows me about Jesus is that his primary concern wasn't the storm, um, but it was our trust. 
did his disciples know he was really on the boat with them? Jesus thought that he knew, Jesus thought that they knew who he was. It turns out they didn't. They allowed themselves to be overwhelmed by fear and worry in the wake of this storm. You know, a lot has happened in the past few weeks um, that has really caused me personally to lose my inner peace. And we need to see the storm. We can't tune out. We need to be in the storm. We need to understand it. We need to see what's going on and the hurt that's in our world. Don't become numb to it. However, we can't forget who's in our boat. For me, what communion means to me right now is an absolute necessary reminder of who's in my boat. That in the middle of the storm, Jesus' primary concern is you. I believe that Jesus truly wants us to attain inner peace, which comes from complete and total trust in him. This is something that I hope everyone can feel and reside in today. This inner peace which comes from him. As we move forward in our own personal path during this challenging time, and we stand up for equality and justice and liberty for all, and as we love our neighbors and shine God's light in our communities, I just pray that you can attain inner peace and the peace that comes from Jesus. And with that, I'll pray. Father God in heaven, Lord, I come before you right now uh, just in awe of who you are, in awe of who your son is and his power and his majesty. God, I just uh, I pray in the wake of all the things that are going on in our world, um, just all the terrible pain and hurt, um, I pray that you can cleanse the world. I pray that you can help us to attain inner peace. I pray that at this time right now um, that we can focus in on you and your love and your peace and, and that we can put our whole and complete trust in you, God. Um, Lord, I want to pray for uh, Ahmad Avery and his family and um, just all the pain and hurt that they're feeling. I pray for justice for George Floyd and Ahmaud, Ahmaud Avery and um, for Breonna Taylor and all the other people that have been affected and hurt uh, just by racism and bigotry in our world, God. And I, I pray that you can really just allow this to be the start of a new world. Um, God, thank you so much for this time, and we pray this in his name. Amen. Potomac Valley Church, I am so grateful that God has been leading us in an amazing way. As we continue with our series, Constant Walking with God Through the Messy Middle, I have an important announcement to share with all of you. As a congregation, we have been seeking to navigate the realities that we find ourselves in in a way that is consistent with Scripture. Over the past several weeks, we've talked a lot about the example of the early church and their response to how they dealt with inequity in the early church in Acts chapter 6. Their response was this. The apostles recognized that there was a problem. They listened to the concerns. They empowered a group of seven men full of faith in the Holy Spirit, and they engaged the issues comprehensively. By God's grace, in Acts 6 and verse 7, what we see is that the numbers of disciples increased rapidly and many priests became obedient to the faith. It is not unusual that there would be challenges in the church. What is exceptional about the response of the early church was that they did not shy away from the challenges, but instead they leaned in. They embraced that they were a mess and that they were entrusted with bringing the message of the gospel even though they were a mess. And they addressed issues comprehensively. 
It is that pattern that we're seeking to follow here in the Potomac Valley Church. Our U.S. diversity team, the International Churches of Christ diversity team, has encouraged every congregation to set up its own diversity team on a local level. Here in Potomac Valley, we're seeking to take that good advice, but to ensure that as we're taking that advice, that we're following carefully the pattern that we see in Scripture. In our congregation, we have many men who are full of faith and the Holy Spirit. We have a deep bench. But I want to put before the congregation today a group of five brothers who we all know. These are trusted and respected brothers. This is also a diverse team of brothers, consistent with the biblical pattern that includes members of the affected group and also members of the group that that might not be directly affected by the concerns around inequity and bias in our world and in our congregation. The five men that we would like to put before the church for consideration to be deacons are Brandon Thorpe, Tim Lloyd, Phil Starr, Bruce Facundus, and Brian Valencia. These are men full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit. I pray that you will pray with us and that you'll share any concerns that you have with this men and the, these men and their families to them directly. But if you have concerns of a sensitive nature that you'd like to bring to the leadership, our core group has designated Tom and Eileen Martin as the ones for you to bring those concerns. We welcome you bringing any concerns over the next seven days. And over the next seven days, we will be praying together as a congregation. On the 24th, we will join all of the ACR churches in a uh, baton-like pass of fasting and praying. But for Potomac Valley specifically, I want to encourage everyone to fast and pray about these five candidates that we're putting forward. We've also asked Patrick Oliveras and Dan, Dan Hines, who currently serve as deacons, to join this team so that we will have a full complement of seven men full of faith in the Holy Spirit to address any issues of inequity. I want to be clear. The goal for this group of deacons is not simply that we would bring our concerns to them, but rather that they would ensure that our ministry staff, our leaders, and the congregation receive comprehensive diversity and bias training, that we're able to get recommendations as a leadership from them in terms of how we can move forward to ensure that in our church that we have the most equitable and righteous practices that truly honor God. I also want to be abundantly clear that deacons have ecclesiastical responsibility, but not ecclesiastical authority. And so we have asked Patrick and Ruth Jones to provide oversight for uh, this deacon body um, so that we can ensure that they have clear uh, leadership and organizational support and that they can work collaboratively with our core group so that we can eradicate anything that would dishonor God. Our prayer is that as we move forward, that we address issues not just in the here and now, but we really address issues in a way that is responsible and is proactive so that for generations to come, our church can be strong and firmly established, always following the constant example of Scripture. I pray that you walk boldly and confidently knowing that as a church, we are resolved to stay constant with our God, even as we walk with Him through the messy middle. I encourage you right now to enjoy this amazing message and to be inspired by this amazing message from our brother, Michael Burns, from the Minneapolis, Minnesota Church. Greetings to the Potomac Valley Church. I'm Michael Burns. I'm coming to you from the Twin Cities uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul of Minnesota. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be able to be with you. Uh, you know, I don't have to tell you how much uh, is going on in the world these days. Uh, it's, it's a crazy time. We have a global pandemic. We have a, a revolution of sorts, a social revolution that's taking place uh, in the world in response in, in, you know, direct part, in large part to uh, events that have happened 
here in Minneapolis. And there's, there's so many forces in the world that can put pressure on us and separate us and, and bring us apart. And certainly that would include uh, our, our racial identities, our ethnic identities, uh, our, our different sort of histories and experiences. And I want to talk to you today about uh, one of those forces that can either uh, separate us very easily or we can use this uh, vehicle as something to bring incredible glory to God and do something that's very difficult and almost impossible for the world to do and, uh, and, and come together uh, in this way. And so I want to talk to you today about culture and the power of culture. And before I get into that, I want to tell you um, two little stories that uh, happened to me as I was uh, a parent uh, raising my children. We have uh, two sons. One is 25, one is 17. And when our 20, now 25-year-old was um, probably around eight or nine years old, somewhere in that range, uh, one night I was sleeping in the middle of the night, and I, my wife is an ICU nurse, and she was at work on an overnight shift, and I heard him stumbling up the steps kind of in the middle of the night. It was probably two or three o'clock, something in that range. And uh, he began, you know, you hear this sort of ghostly timber of his voice go, Dad. And I kind of woke up out of my sleep and I looked up a little bit and I heard him say it again. And he got to the top of the steps because our, our whole room was that floor. Um, it was a converted attic. And so as he got to the top of the steps, I kind of caught on and realized what was happening. And he started to stumble towards the bed. And as the, you know, loving, caring father that I am, I said, no, 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 turn around because I knew what was coming. And he got to the edge of the bed and he went Bleh, like that and projectile vomited all over me and the bed. And uh, I couldn't believe it. Uh, you know, it's the middle of the night. I had to like clean him off, get him back to bed, make sure he was okay, go up and take all the sheets off, uh, clean myself off, you know, a uh, middle of the night shower and just, uh, it, it was terrible. And then let me fast forward a couple of years <clears throat> to our second son. He's now about 18 months old. And uh, once again, my wife was uh, at the hospital at work. Uh, that's a common theme to my stories, evidently. And so I, uh, I'm getting ready. I, I got to go to work. I'm a high school teacher at the time. This is before I went into the full-time ministry uh, as, a, uh, as a teacher in the Two Cities Church. I should have told you that at the beginning, but I'm telling you now. Um, so... There I am. I'm, I run into his room because I got to get him ready and then take him to daycare. And my wife would do this thing sometimes where she'd put him to bed before she'd go to work. And she'd be like, you know, now here's a cookie on your nightstand. If you go to sleep like a good boy, you can have the cookie in the morning. And so I walked in there and I looked and I was like, why would she give him a candy bar? Now he got a hold of it. It's everywhere. And I started to walk over to the crib and I was like, oh, that's not a candy bar. And the smell immediately let me know that something else had terrible had happened. And so I looked in and there had been a diaper blowout. And um, instead of being horrified by that, the way you would think a human being would be, um, my son decided to turn into finger painting Bob Ross at the moment and started finger painting all over the walls and the slats of the crib and his his own head and the 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 mattress and it was everywhere and so now i had to quick like one more impromptu shower clean it you know hose him off in in the tub and grab up all the sheets and everything and if you had come to me at 15 years old and said you are going to be in a place in your life <clears throat> where you allow people to vomit all over you and do poop art in your house I would have told them they were crazy. Why would anybody put up with that? And the reason is, is because you see, like many of you, I fell in love with a girl and we got married. And before long, they give you these babies and you fall in love with them. And that changes what you're willing to deal with. That love becomes your why. 
and all those little gross things, people spitting, sneezing, vomiting, you know, all the things that kids do, those are the what's. And all of a sudden you're willing to deal with a lot more what's when your why is bigger than your what's. Here's the thing. In Matthew 28, Jesus stands before his disciples and he says, here's the mission I'm giving you. Go make disciples, right? Except that's not what he says. And you might be questioning me right now. Oh, no, no, no. I've memorized that verse. I know that Jesus says, go make disciples. Uh, that was in my Bible studies. I've studied that with people. That's not what he says, though. Because you see, if you uh, cut a sentence in half, it changes the meaning, right? If I were to tell you, uh, I'm going to shoot my sons, a text telling them that I love them. You see, the second half of that sentence is really important. If you just stop it, I'm going to shoot my sons, that's a crime. And so when Jesus says, go make disciples, he says, of all nations. That goes back to the promises God gave Abraham. That goes back to the promises of the Old Testament. God says, in response to the division at Babel, I'm going to do something that the world can't do. I'm going to bring the nations back together. I'm going to bring all these differences that you've turned into divisions and the chaos of the world that was caused by your rebellion. I'm going to bring it back together. And what the world, well, I'm sorry, what God has divided, the world will not be able to put back together. And so Jesus says, time is now. The promises are happening. Go make disciples of all nations. Now that tells me that the body of Christ is going to be diverse. It's going to be full of people from every tribe and language and people group and nation. And that means culture. And cultures are challenging to bring people of different cultures together because culture is a powerful force. It's simply the rules, the unwritten rules, that a group of people decide to live by. But culture impacts everything we do. The way we greet one another, the way we think, the things we assume, the way you should act to be respectful and kind, the way you should act in public, the way you should speak to me and others, the way from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to bed, most of what you do is determined by the culture that you grew up in or the culture that you've embraced. And so sociologists actually tell us that we're, we so like to be immersed in our own culture that it is physically exhausting to be around other cultures. And so, like I said, it impacts our preferences, our assumptions, our comfort zones. Everything about culture will naturally separate us. And the world's come up with some ways to get around that. We'll tolerate one another. Well, tolerate will help us understand and coexist, but tolerance will not bring us and keep us together. It's kind of like the law, the Old Testament law. Paul argues throughout the scriptures, the law was good to quarantine Israel until the Messiah could come. But the law separated Israel from the nations. And the fundamental promise of the Old Testament is that God will gather the nations. So if the promise is that God will gather the nations and the purpose of the law is to separate Israel from the nations, then the law can get you to the Messiah, but the law could never be the answer because by nature, it will separate. Well, that's kind of the way it is a little bit with culture. By, by nature, it separates us. And so the problem is, though, the law we can just leave behind. Culture is inside of us. We can't just drop it. It takes a little more work than that. And so this force that wants to constantly separate us, we have to work to become something that will glue us together and that takes an incredible amount of work. I want to read a passage for you here. In 1 Corinthians 9, Paul is addressing a church full of different cultures. You've got different um, 
ethnic groups, you've got different socioeconomic statuses, which was a very big deal in the Greco-Roman culture. And Paul says, though, this is verse 19, 1 Corinthians 9, though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. So Paul says, I've been myself. I will act lower than I am in the social status. And that was never done in Roman culture. You did not lower yourself in status. That's crazy. But Paul says, I, I will do that. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. I got out of my, you know, for, for him, that's his normal status. He, he, he's like, I can, I can, you know, roll with that. To those under the law, I became like one under the law. Though my, I myself am not under the law. So Paul says, I grew up in this. I understand how to operate in that culture, but it's not really where my heart's at anymore. And he says, I did this so as to win those under the law. Verse 21, he says, to those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, although I'm not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law. So as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. And by weak there, he means the socially outcast, the low ones. I have become, he says, all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. Paul says, I became a slave. I changed myself. I adapt myself for the sake of God's mission to gather the nations. That's our why. God wants to bring us together. But he goes on, he says, I do this all for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. This coming together of the nations, Paul will call it, it's the mystery of Christ. It is how we fully participate in the wisdom of God and display the wisdom of God to the world. It's part of the blessings that God wants to give us, this diversity. But he's realistic about it. In verse 24, he says, do you not know that in a race all runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and I make it my slave so that after I have preached others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Now, Paul's still talking about his cultural humility there. I will become whatever I need to be. I will adapt my culture for the sake of you. And he's calling us all to adopt that. And he says, it will take work. It will be struggle. It is like an athlete training for games. It is like disciplining my body and beating it and ma making it uh, be disciplined and, and obey. This is going to be hard work. It's not easy to adapt our culture, to be part of a group that's multicultural. It's just not easy. There's so many, you know, different things in the world out there now trying to train and multiculturalism and how to do it. And if you could simply do it through a course, it would have been done already. But I believe that the only way to do it is by submitting ourselves to Christ and creating a Christ culture. Here's the thing with culture. We bring it in to the church with us. We all have culture. Culture is not a sin. It's just simply how we operate as human beings. And you, you, you're never taught your own culture. You just breathe it in. It's how everybody around you acts. And so it starts to feel like normal. And that's fine. It's, it's good. That's how we can operate without constantly explaining every little thing we're doing. The problem comes in when I start to embrace my normal and I'm comfortable with it and I don't want to change. And then all of a sudden, I am put into a situation where I'm next to you, and you have a different culture, a different normal, and I start to think, what kind of human being would act that way? That's rude, that's disrespectful, that's obnoxious, whatever it may be, and we don't stop to think that 
we're conditioned by our culture to do things a way, but we start to think that our way is the way. And we get nasty. We get nasty about culture. Sometimes out and out with it, but a lot of times in our heart. And we start to judge other people. And we start to, I don't want to be around them. I, we start to make judgments. They're not a nice person. They're not uh, maybe even a good disciple. But so many of the conflicts that we have at the root are cultural. Now, they may bring in other complexities, you know, historical or racial or whatever, but the root oftentimes is cultural. And if we don't understand what the root is, we won't be able to deal with it. We'll be arguing and talking about other things. Let me give you several examples of that. Culture can cause us to approach politics differently. Well, how can it do that? Well, let me explain. Uh, and I'm going to use my wife and I as an example uh, in a lot of these. Um, I'm your typical, as you could probably tell, typical white guy. I grew up in a s smaller town in Wisconsin. Um, you know, and that's about as exciting as it gets. My wife is a, a beautiful African-American woman who grew up in the central city. We grew up in very, very different um, places, socioeconomically and especially culturally. Uh, she grew up in Wisconsin. Her family was from uh, Mississippi. Um, and so they had a very rural uh, sort of, you know, upbringing and culture uh, from, you know, the old world, so to speak. And so I grew up in a very highly individualist culture. Uh, my wife grew up in a culture that was much more collective and communal, and we're all in this together, kind of uh, a, a very much a, a vestige of uh, the tribal culture uh, that her ancestors had come from, uh, from the African cultures, uh, West Africa. And so when we start to, uh, you know, in typical, and there's always exceptions, uh, uh, but the the typical response, and I'll say the archetypal, that's one of those words. An archetype is when you look at a group and you say, what's the typical response for them? Now, a stereotype is when you look at the group and you say, everyone must act that way because they're part of that group. But archetype is, you know, there's some general truths uh, about that group. And so um, the archetype for my culture is that we grew up very individualistic and you're trained to think that way. Um, and you, you're trained to be responsible for yourself, to, uh, you know, take care of yourself, to raise yourself up. Um, you don't need help. You don't want help. Don't, you know, don't give, try to give me help. I don't need it. And, uh, but I expect you to be responsible for you. And so one of the cardinal sins you can commit in my culture is not being responsible for yourself. Um, you just, it's personal responsibility. It's part of the culture. My wife's culture being that communal mindset was we're all in this together. And if someone needs help, you don't stop and ask how they get here or why they need help. You just give them help. We're all in it together. And so we pool our resources and our effort. And that's the way life is approached. And it works in that culture. And that's well and fine. But when you start to approach politics, do you see what I'm saying? I would be drawn to very sort of individualist, um, leaning type politics, self-responsibility, self. And I'm not saying that self-responsibility is bad, but my wife's culture is naturally drawn to communal solutions. And so now we have these political differences you know, we and we get these in the church, and we start to argue about, are you crazy? This is, you know, it should be this party or this way of thinking this way. And we never stop to think that, man, the root of our differences is our cultural assumptions of what's good. Because in my wife's culture, the cardinal sin is to not help someone who's in need. And in my culture, the cardinal sin is to be in need. Because you should have taken care of yourself. And so we can't even start to find a solution until we understand culture. 
Um, here's another one. You know, these things that happen in the news, we've had so many of them lately. Um, and in the past, one of the things that would come up, now I, I, I'm starting to see some really amazing changes in our family of churches in this area. And, and that's uh, incredible. I think we're learning. But one of the dynamics that I, I have seen at play in the past, and I, it still will be around, is when something takes place that's really troubling, an Ahmad Arbery situation, a, a Floyd George situation, these tragedies that happen, and uh, there's pain surrounding it, and everyone in the world and the news is talking about it, and we come to church on Sunday. The culture I grew up in, the typical white church culture, you know what you don't talk about on Sunday? You don't talk about politics and controversial things. Leave that out in the world. Here, you're going to clear your mind of all your tr troubles and trials, and we're going to fix our eyes on Jesus. Just clear your minds of what's going on out there. That's what church is for. So we're not going to talk about those things. We don't have to say it. Nobody has to come to church and say we're not going to talk about that stuff because we all know it. It's a cultural assumption. The way my wife grew up, and probably many of, of uh, you watching this did. I, I don't know, but I'm going to assume um, that, that because usually it's, you know, half and half in diverse churches, and we come from these different cultural backgrounds. But she came uh, from a cultural church background where it, 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 the one thing you did talk about at church was the pain that was going on in the world. The, the injustice, the where's God in this. Church was the one place you could come for comfort and to commiserate and talk about it. And what are we going to do? We don't have to plan to talk about that when these things come up because we know that's what we're going to do at church. But when we're in a diverse church that God has called us to be, oh, do you see the problem? We come together. And we have a leadership group that maybe is dominated by one culture. They don't even think about it. We're not going to talk about it. That's not what church is for. And you have a group of people who are in pain, who are suffering from what's going on. And, and in, in many of these cultures, there's an identification with the collectivist culture where if one thing, if something happens to one of us, it happens to all of us. That's my son. That's my brother. And I know my wife feels that in a way that I had to learn to appreciate. Because as an individualist culture, I didn't view it that way. She does. And you come to church, the one place where you can find comfort from your pain and grief, and nothing is said. What message does that send to you? Hmm. They don't care about us. They don't love us. And it starts to look like even a racial thing. But the cause is typically culture. And if we don't know that, we're going to have trouble addressing it. Culture causes us to communicate differently. Some of us grew up in a direct communication uh, background and and there's culture at all levels. It can be national, it can be regional, it can be family, that all influence us. And so some people come from a culture where it's just direct. You say it right out how it is. Boom! This is what I'm seeing. Other people come from an indirect culture, and so it's it's rude. Uh, it's disrespectful to say something straight out. And so imagine you get two people. They could be from the same uh, ethnic group. And they're in a discipling relationship. And one comes and says something very direct. And it hurts the feelings of the other one. They don't even know why. And they walk away thinking that person is unkind and unloving. I can't be in a spiritual relationship with them. And now they think that it's a spiritual conflict. But it's actually a cultural difference that they've not learned to recognize. And so they can't deal with it. They don't have the skills. Paul says, I've learned to be all things to all people. I go after this. I study. I'm aware of it. He's talking about culture. You know, culture can cause us to uh, approach mistakes differently. Now, this is one of those I think is actually tends to be um, along the lines of generational culture. Uh, older folks versus younger folks. 
people my age and up, when you made a mistake, you know what you were judged by? Your intent. If you said something wrong, you could simply say, oh, I'm sorry, that's not what I meant. Uh, my bad. And everybody would go, fair enough. He didn't, that's not what he intended. Let's move on. The younger generation tends to, and again, speaking in archetypes here, tends to um, judge by, not by intent, but by impact. So if I say something wrong and somebody's offended by it or it hurts them, it doesn't matter uh, so much if I say, oh, that's not what I meant. doesn't matter. It's what you did to that person. You've got to own it. And so now we can have a real conflict. You could have somebody say, uh, you know, this, and they say something wrong. And somebody goes, that hurt me. You need to apologize for that. Well, I'm not going to apologize. It was a mistake. I didn't, I didn't mean it. And now we have a conflict. And these are cultural assumptions and presumptions about how we should act. Culture can cause us to see respect differently. Things that feel respectful um, to one person can be disrespectful to another person. And man, can that cause conflict um, in a church. Uh, uh, my wife and I have, the, you know, families too. My wife and I, we have, um, we have little bumps with that all the time because I'll do things that, it's how you do it, right? It's how human beings do it. But it's, it seems off to her. It seems wrong. And so we're constantly having to recognize and, and identify and understand these things. And we can have uh, different expectations, different assumptions. You know, it, it can be in it can be in big ways. It can be in little ways. Um, and we we don't understand uh, these things. When you when you have groups come together, you often have a dominant culture and a non-dominant culture. And so you got to figure out, uh, you know, it's different in each group. Now, I'll say as a family of churches um, in the United States, uh, our, our global fellowship uh, tends to be a white Western American culture. That's just the dominant culture. And so we can have very different expectations. And if we're not aware of these things, if we don't become like Paul, we can just steamroll over the non-dominant culture and not even be aware that there's a problem. And meanwhile, they're starting to feel like you want my presence, but not my participation. I got to pretend or act like someone else to be around here. Why am I? Why are we always the one who has to adapt our culture? See, when everybody's being all things to all people, we can become something beautiful. And notice that Paul's standard, this is participation. It goes beyond toleration. That's the best the world can, can, can come up with. But Paul says, now I'm going to participate. When we're all doing it, it works. But when the dominant culture is not aware, and let's face reality, in normal everyday life, people from the dominant culture, you don't even know you have a culture. That culture, I don't I don't have a culture. We just there's not a culture in this church. We know why do we got to talk about culture? Why do we got to include your culture? Why don't we just do things normally? That's the privilege of a dominant culture status. And you are damaging the diversity of the body of Christ and the ability to stay united if you are of the dominant culture and refuse to recognize that. There's been a lot of racially and ethnically diverse movements in the history of the United States going back hundreds of years. And they've been very excited about breaking color barriers, breaking, you know, racial barriers, breaking ethnic barriers, uh, whatever the language was at the time. And yet every single one, virtually every one, of those movements fell apart, usually within about 40 years. And the reason is they didn't pay attention to the power of culture, to being all things to all people. And when we don't do that, those what's become bigger than our why. Why am I even doing this? 
And the non-dominant group will start to say, you don't understand what we're dealing with. You don't, you don't love us. You don't include us. We're always having to do things your way. I just want to go be around my own people where I'm comfortable, where it fits. And it is easier to be around people who have a culture like ours. Here's the thing. If you come to church and you're never culturally uncomfortable, that's not a good sign. That means either your church is not culturally diverse or it's shallow. But it probably means that you're part of the dominant culture and you're not being very inclusive. You're part of a church that is not being all things to all people. And if you come to church and you're always culturally uncomfortable, that's not a good sign either. That means that you got to keep being patient and loving, but pressure, loving persistence, and say, we've got to change. Because if you're feeling that, when people come in, they will see it or they will experience it soon enough. So what can we do? Well, as I've said already from 1 Corinthians 9, it will take constant effort. Even in a marriage, we have to work at it. We have to remind ourselves what our motivating factor is. Keep that why bigger than those what's. When, peop when, when people's what's get bigger than their why, that's when divorce happens. And when people's what's get bigger than their why, they leave church. It will grind and eat at many folks if we're not aware of culture. And even when we are, it's a challenge. My wife and I have been together 25 years, and it's still a grind sometimes. We have to work at communicating in our culture. It is exhausting. So we have to remind ourselves of the why. This is God's mission. This is how he's showing his wisdom to the world. It has to be bigger than the challenges. And they are many, especially right now. We have to learn about our own culture. You got you to know that you have a culture and understand that dynamic. You got to be real with it. Um you got to understand how committed you are to it and become flexible and humble and be willing to change. You got to realize and ask, does my culture bring me privileges as part of the dominant culture? Am I willing to be all things to all people and to lay that down? We've got to be willing to ask one another just on a practical level, hey, uh, what did you mean by that? When something feels off, what did you mean by that? So if we're willing to examine our own culture and, and do that interpretation, hey, you know, um, you did this, it felt this way. What did you mean by that? Oh, no, this is what I meant. Have those conversations. That's going to be very healing. A lot of this is going to be on the dominant group. And before you start to think, wait, you're only challenging the dominant group. What about the non-dominant group? Remember, they are adapting all of the time. And so it's time that the dominant folks do some work. Don't get defensive about it. That will destroy unity. Now, a non-dominant group can destroy unity with bitterness and a lack of patience and a, a lack of pressure to include them. We got to be gracious with one another. We also have to know that mistakes will happen. Tension will happen. As I said, if you're never culturally uncomfortable, that's not good. But if there is tension and conflict and you, there is struggle and you're working through these things, that's actually not a bad sign. That's a sign that you're doing it right. There will be this conflict. The New Testament is constantly addressing 30% of Paul's writings, he's addressing the coming together of different cultures and walking the church how, through how to be unified with that. So this, the struggle is a sign 
that we've got our why on right. We are the gathering of the nations, the diverse body that God wants us to be, and that will be challenging. So when we have those trials, we know we're on the right road. And we've got to work to create a Christ culture that is inclusive of all cultures. We've got to challenge assumptions. We've got to be creative. We've got to include all voices at every level of the church. We've got to be willing to challenge our comfort zones. We've got to be willing to question some of our sacred cows. Is that the way to do it or is it just our way? And are there other ways that we could explore and make people feel valued and included and not have a default culture, but create a Christ culture that is a collection of all the cultures? We've got to be intentional about this. It won't happen by accident. Creating a Christ culture is not like going on cruise control. It's like a steering wheel that needs constant attention. Cruise control, you can put it on and sit back a little bit. Take your foot off the gas. But a steering wheel, you've got to have constant attention. That's the way culture is. And finally, I want to end with these words and remind you. 1 Peter 4, 8 says to love one another deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Potomac Valley Church, I've never been with you, but I love you all. Uh, thank you so much to Will for asking me to speak to you today. Um, let's continue to do the work to be all things to all people. Thank you, and I love you. We're so grateful for that incredible message that Michael preached to us today. I pray that you look at the scriptures and consider how the Holy Spirit really used him to speak to all of our hearts. Let's go to God right now in a word of prayer as we center our hearts and prepare to go out into the rest of the week. Let's go to God in a word of prayer. Our God, Father, thank you so much for allowing us to gather as your believers one more Sunday. God, thank you so much for the amazing ways that you've spoke to us through Alex's communion today, God. Thank you, God, for this incredible Father's Day that we get to celebrate together. Father, thank you for bringing Michael Burns all the way from Minneapolis, Minnesota to be able to speak your word and preach your word to us today. Please help the things that we've learned today to sink deep into our hearts. Help our fellowship to get stronger and clearer and more resolute. God, we pray a special prayer. As God, by faith, will be adding more deacons to our deacon team. And God, I pray that by your grace and mercy, you will help us as a congregation to grow stronger and more resolute in our faith so that all people at all times will be able to hear your amazing message and will find Potomac Valley to be a place where they see Jesus lived, Christ preached, and so many more people come to know you and become your disciples. We pray that you bless and guide and direct us. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.